Thanks very much, Grace and Mary. And we wish you a safe journey back home to the Kingdom. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Rory Farley, Chief Director of Nursing and Midwifery in the RCSI Hospital Group. The title of Professor Rory's, uh, Farley's speech is Experiences in a Changing Landscape of an, in an Integrated Health and Social Care System. And my thanks to Rory for facilitating the change in the programme. Thank you. Right, good afternoon and hello everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, lovely. Um, delighted to be here. Thanks to the Dean and obviously the Acting Chief Exec and the Exec Committee of the Faculty and the Organising Committee for the invitation today. Um, as the Dean has said, I'm obviously the Chief Director of Nursing and Medical for the RCSI Hospital Group. So also delighted to be here because obviously the RCSI is our academic partner of the hospital group. And within the hospital group, I was just giving everybody a reminder what's in the group, is obviously Beaumont Hospital, St. Joseph's Rohini, um, Cavan, Monaghan, Our Ladies of Lourdes Hospital in Drogheda, Loud County Hospital, the Rotunda Hospital and Conway Hospital. So I'm going to share with you this afternoon some of my experiences. I've spent the last 30 years working actually within the UK system and the last 14 years within Wales and Scotland in an in integrated um, health and social care system where legislation has changed in both countries to make that happen. So I'm going to draw upon some of my experiences. I have actually tested this out with some of my colleagues in Wales because I'm a firm believer of shared governance and actually all of the pres presenters here today spoke about actually what I would call shared governance from the floor up and actually seeing the views of staff across the whole organisation and different disciplines and actually their views and how things should go. Um, and obviously there's now compelling evidence when you look at the North American model in relation to actually engagement of staff. If staff are highly engaged, listened to, and the important thing about listened to is you believe what they say, actually you will have uh, very well engaged staff and your outcomes for patients or people if it's in community is actually of a high quality. So that actually is now emerging, particularly within some of the North American states. Okay, so I'm um, going back to end this journey, but I haven't called it a journey. There's a road, and maybe it's you in the car dreaming going forward there. Um, but there is no doubt, when I took up my first director of nursing post in Scotland for the uh, North Hill Sick Children's Hospital, which ironically, Children's Services was integrated within the UK, and was probably one of the examples of where integration of healthcare was actually in the right place, and actually there was a lot of learning taken from how we had integrated primary, secondary care, and mental health within Children's Services and all the mental adults. So that landscape has changed significantly within my 14 years as the Director of Nursing in relation to um, working at board level. And I suppose integration of care doesn't, does not evolve naturally, it needs to be nurtured, would be very much based upon my experience. And actually, I think up here, you know, we will see examples of where, um, when you look at the evidence of this commission of provider approaches within, um, actually, particularly within England, where they have gone very much down a, a commission route at various different levels. Scotland and Wales stuck to an integrated health board where it had a direct reporting right to the relevant government because health was devolved both within the Scottish and the Welsh context. Interestingly, you will be aware post New Zealand's earthquake, they had to do a dramatic change in their health and social care system. And they set up quite a lot of their digital and I would say there's probably quite a lot of similarities and learning to be taken from the New Zealand system into the Irish system. From what I've, I've, I've learned about it. And I think um, it is important that actually um, we do look at some of, even though there isn't a huge amount of emergence of evidence around um, integration, it's important that actually we look at those areas that have done it and take the lessons they've learned from it and um, see can we apply it I suppose one of the things for me that's important, so as part of my presentation today, was how I learn. So I, I think up here there's a lot on actually how I learn, and actually, you know, I'm, I'm still a firm believer in actually reflection. I'm currently and have been in an action learning set for the last 14 years. And actually, it's really important that I, as a director of nursing, actually am able to demonstrate that I'm learning and improving things actually I'm doing and encouraging all staff to do that. That's hugely benefited me in relation to actually my development. And this is a model 
And there are loads of different models out there around learning. And I think it's really important that we all should be thinking about how we are taking our learning and, and moving that into practice. Like the core components of successful integration. I mean, this is, some of this I have referenced back to work that was done in the King's Fund. And some of it, quite a lot of it's come from my own experience though in relation to, and I've been able to link it with some academic articles to support that. Effective leadership at all levels is crucial. I'm probably going back to, it's quite interesting, when I've listened to all of the presentations prior to me, there's, there's a huge amount of commonality in relation to actually what we should all be doing as professionals. And I'm a firm believer leadership's really important at every level. And everybody has a voice, and that's really important we be brave, and actually learn to use that voice. And it's also okay to get it wrong, because I've got it wrong. And if you get it wrong, you just need to make another decision to do something else. And I think sometimes the system and our teams we work in sometimes don't allow us to get it wrong. And I think that's okay to get it wrong, as long as we're willing to hold our hands up and say, well, those two things were wrong, and this is actually what we've learned from it, but those two things were right. So that leadership bit of it's important. And one of my comments, and I mean, I've only been back in the system since December of this year, one of my comments, and it probably goes back to what Enda said, uh, the system's quite hierarchical within Ireland. And, and I don't know if that's other people's experience, which sometimes can stifle a shared governance approach, and it can stifle enthusiasm at a number of different levels. And ambition, you know, I, I think ambition is really important. There's been a huge amount of successes in the Irish system around the development of nursing and midwifery. Patient and carer engagement. I think, you know, I, I debate over the years as a patient, as a people. I mean, I'm a firm believer, no matter who it is, whether it's somebody within a primary care setting, a prison setting, a mental health setting, a learning disability setting, a community setting, we should put them at the centre of what we're doing. And we should do it, there's a term which I don't really like that's used in the literature, it's called co-production. And, and that's about doing things with people, not doing things for people. Actually, that with bit is really important. And, and sometimes within the health system and the social care system within the UK, they tended to do things for people rather than with people and actually ask what matters to them so therefore they can actually get it right. Um, one of the things that legislation changed both within the Scottish system and within the Welsh system is maybe accountability for the population of the health of the health board, the health board's responsibility. It wasn't government's responsibility, it was actually the health board's responsibility. They were responsible for the health of the whole population. So both within Wales and within Scotland, I was the accountant officer board for nursing for the prison service, for mental health, for learning disability, community services, and for secondary care. And one of the challenges is 85% of our interactions went on in primary care, not secondary care. And actually, when I look at system here at the moment, we often spend a lot of time talking about secondary care and actually when most of the interactions are actually happening within our community. So there is something about we need to prepare ourselves within, I would say, within the current system of how we do need to work differently. It doesn't mean to say there are challenges in secondary care, I get that, but actually most of the interaction happens out within our primary care community sessions. Um, and I think it's really important that we do place more focus on the population health, not on the secondary care issue. You know, and beds is a real challenge, and I know Mary and Grace spoke about that and other people, but it isn't the only challenge. So I think we need to step into other arenas around that conversation. Shared accountability for performance. This bit was really interesting, and my learning within the Welsh and the Scottish system is we had representatives who sat on our board from local authority. The local authority were responsible for certain things, the board were responsible for the whole picture. So that did generate significant debate around accountability. So the avenue into that was we talked about shared accountability. So where there was something, talking about secondary care, talking about delayed discharges, social care had an impact on that. So we went forward together to be clear of what our actions were to improve it from a patient perspective, rather than try to identify somebody and say, Roy Farrelly's head's on the block hasn't delivered ABC and D. I think there's a bit of a, a crossroads within the Irish system where accountability is muddled. 
but also there is a societal view that they want someone's head in a block. And, and I'm not too sure, from an engagement perspective, if that's the society and culture we want to develop, because we have to be clear we are going to get things wrong. And I think that's the important thing here is that reassuring the public we're learning from what we get wrong, rather than saying, Rory Farrelly done those four things, he made a major mistake, he made a major mistake. He's put his head in the block, and actually, um, that will not generate the best performing healthcare system when you look at the evidence from North America. So there is something about how we actually apply some of that. Use of guidelines to promote best practice. Now, this was a significant debate when we integrated our community teams with our social care services. Because the NHS within Wales and Scotland and England is free at the point of delivery. Where our social care services was quite clearly driven. You had to have a certain thing in order to access it. So one of the things we had to develop, because it was in some arenas, we actually had social workers who were in charge of nursing teams. Now I was, it was a professional accountability all the way back to the local authority to me, but there was actually managers managing nursing who weren't nurses. So we had to develop shared guidelines on how a team functions. This became a real debate around silo professionalism. Because people were very demarked in the corner, well I'm a nurse, these are the five things I must do. I'm a social worker, these are the five things I must do. I'm a community support worker, these are the five things I must do. But what everybody was missing in all of this was actually the seamlessness for in the community. And actually, we discovered when we mapped a lot of things out, and we've done quite a lot of improvement for it, when we mapped a lot of things out, there's huge repetition going on in the system. And actually, because the team ended up functioning well, it actually delivered what was correct actually for um, the patient and their family or the, the person and their family. The biggest area this was a more of a challenge in was within our secondary care arenas. So within Wales, I had I was part of an organisation that had seven hospitals in it. We tried to get a standardised pathway for orthopaedics, for cardiology, for acute medicine. That actually was a real, real issue, um, particularly on our medical side. But nursing stepped to the forefront and ended up leading it. And I think there's a great opportunity with the Irish system currently at the moment with the involvement of advanced nurse practitioners with the right support. Um, multi specialty groups of health and social care professionals, which um, w w one, of the, one of the things we discovered was 82% of what the individuals who were interacting with us over the age of 75 both across our community sessions and our secondary care sessions. So going back to the point made earlier on, they marry around older people. We are actually in a system where we are going to be managing for more older people right across our secondary care, our community, prison health services. And we have to be prepared for that. And there is a debate going on in England at the moment and, and Wales and Scotland about a generic health worker that can work across the span of ages. Now, that sometimes, if you were to ask me that, because I'm predominantly from a paediatric background, paediatric intensive care, I would never have said that probably. 20 years ago, I would have been one of those staunch ones on you have to actually have specialism. But where we are at the moment, we have to start generating innovation nursing. And actually, how are we going to manage our population going forward when a large percentage of what we're going to deal with is going to be over the age of 75? Now, I don't know what, because I was trying to look this up for today's presentation. I don't know what the stats are for Ireland around that, because I can't find it anywhere. And um, you, you know, but I suspect it won't be far off. UK system, you know, so uh, it's important we develop a, a generic model around caring for older people and then realising the remaining part of the pathways might need some specialists. Physician managed partnerships that links the clinical skills of healthcare professionals with organisational skills. Um, what, one of the things that the, we had to spend a lot of time in was the development of clinical leadership. When I mean clinical leadership, and then uh, allied health professionals, medics, nursing, and nursing because to lead integrated teams in a multidisciplinary way from a leadership perspective, people do need skills and training for that. It's not easy because go back to some of the points that Enda raised in relation to 
be brave, tenacity, resilience. It's so hard, and I sometimes I found it hard over the years, and I have no doubt we'll find it hard going forward. But it's important we recognise where you get the support to actually change that. And I think, and um, I would say, just kind of, I'm still within my hundred days, and I will be doing a report on my hundred days, first hundred days. But there is something for me about Ireland wants the clinical leadership, but it's not allowing it to have its way. We have to find a way to make that voice happen. Clinical leadership. And I would say that for medics as well as allied health professionals as well as nurses, but I have an absolutely strong advocate for nursing. You know, and I think there is something in the Irish system that's still quite managerial led rather than actually physician, clinician led around. And um, now this within Within, within the UK system, those are, they often align finances the wrong way, where they were rewarding bad behaviour rather than good behaviour. So actually, if you are if you had a poor waiting list and you were inefficient, you were actually given more money for those areas that actually were delivering what they were supposed to be delivering, you got nothing. So it's really important as part of an integration system that actually the finances are aligned in the right way, not the wrong way, you know, because actually that will uh, not engage the people on the ground and on the floor to deliver what they need to deliver. And IT, and we obviously heard at the beginning from Noreen in relation to the work that's going on in relation to the integration system of um, patient flow there from an ED perspective, maybe throughout the hospital. One of the things that I would say is really important about IT is people have to redesign their thinking before they use it. Because there is often a perception that actually, oh lovely, we've got an IT system, it's going to radically change things. And then try to apply the paper based approach to the IT based approach. And it doesn't work. No, no, you need to redesign your thinking because this is a completely different way of working. And I would also say one of the mistakes we made within the UK system was people think this will save money, it won't save any money. My experience is IT doesn't save any money. It delivers better efficiency and productivity, but it doesn't actually release any cash. Actually, Sometimes I see business cases where it says if you invest two million pounds in IT, you'll save another three million pounds in something else. And um, I've yet to see that happen within my experience, you know, because it often needs more infrastructure around buying more kit, more equipment, keeping it engaged, you know, etc. Uh, some key organisational barriers from my experience and um, bringing together primary medical services because within the UK GPs were independent practitioners. So they, they actually used to say, well, we can do what we want, and we need to find a way to engage with GPs and make some of the patient pathways seamless. And we had to work very hard in investing within some of our GP practices around advanced nurse practitioners, nurse specialists, support out there to actually deliver. And in some cases, we also put some physios and OTs within our community session within GP practices because of some of the patients actually did require that. Um, the lovely second bullet point there, addressing an unsustainable acute sector. And, and I do think there's more work in the UK still needs to go on around that. But there will be bad press in the UK, but can I just remind everybody, obviously organisations within the UK maybe not delivering the standard of four hours for 90% all organisations are doing it for eight. They're in and out within four hours. So actually, when we look at that compared to the Irish system, we are way off kilter. Experience for patients using our emergency care services is actually not a very good experience. You know, so there is something about actually how do we take some of that learning from the UK and apply it within the current context. Now we know we have a significant bed shortage issue. You know, um, and the government have said they're going to support more beds in the system. But that's what's going to require more staff, and um, you know, um, and that isn't going to solve overnight. That's more of a, you know, I think a three to five year plan at the moment. So you know, the government will say we're going to put an extra five hundred beds in the system before the summer. Um, developing capacity within primary care, we did obviously have to do investment within primary care, particularly within our older people services in actually getting primary care where they had the right skills, support and staff to care for older people in the community, even though because a lot of our community nursing teams only work Monday to Friday. 
We didn't do extended hours, they didn't do the weekends, so we had to invest into the seven day service in order to make that happen. Uh, managing demand and developing new care models. I mean, you know, one of the things particularly that we took from our community services was we done a huge amount of discharging to assess because there was a lot of evidence for older people in particular, once they were in their own environment, they were actually able to cope much better. And you know, if they only had to walk up two steps to get to their house and the physio was making them walk up a flight of stairs in the hospital, actually we were defeating the purpose because we weren't asking the patient what that was them. So we, we developed a concept of discharge to assess where patients were sent home and there was a community team went in straight away to assess the patient and actually make sure that they were coping at home and they could actually stay at home and that had a very high success rate of 92%. I think secondary care professionals, and I say that as I was a secondary care professional myself, is we can be really risk averse and actually we think of, you know, every job has to be lined up. So again, we have to really think about what's going to matter to the patient and their family and put that actually in place within, within community. Establishing effective clinical leadership for change. Again, I think as part of that, it's about how we develop clinical leaders to have strong voices around what is the right thing and what's the wrong thing. Sometimes I think, and some of you in this room will have heard me say this, but sometimes I think there's sometimes only one voice out there, and I think there's a lot more than one voice, and we need to find a way to generate a wider debate within society about clinical leadership and the voice of clinical leadership across all groups. That's even though I would be a strong advocate for nursing and midwifery. Overcoming professionals and tribalism and tough wars, I don't know if we've ever really cracked that, but it did get better once teams worked together. But I think that's part of a much wider cultural change. And I think when you look at Places like Kaiser Permanente, and even though they're very secondary care focused in the States, I mean, some of their evidence has shown it's taken years to change some of that. I think you have to be in the, you have to be in the view, we're going to do these things. It's a long journey, going back to your words, you don't like it, but it is, I think there's something about that resilience of how we actually keep at the things in order to uh, make it happen. Uh, good data and IT, we've got a real issue, we, uh, we had a real issue around that. And we did develop integrated systems around IT and moved to an electronic system. But one of the things I think we highly underestimated was people didn't redesign their thinking. Um, involving the public and creating a narrative about new models of care because there was certainly a view in parts of the UK that I worked where the general public wanted to see a doctor weren't happy until they saw a doctor. And thankfully we changed all of that over a period of eight years. But if, if there is, I don't know what the Irish system is about that yet at the moment, but there can still be a bit of a view, let's go to ED or let's go to I need to see my GP where there could be another professional like an advanced nurse practitioner who actually do the same thing of a higher quality in my view. And um, and I think it's also important we're honest with the public something they're looking for we can't do, we should be able to say we're not able to do it at this point. Um, but we may be able to do it in three months' time. That transparency bit um, needs to get to a better place, I think, for us to um, that. Establishing new forms of organisation and governance. Well, you know, one of the things that probably helped within the Welsh and the Scottish system, even though I always thought it was a shame, they made it legislative, so they it as an organisation within the public sector. Um, and I, even though legislation at times didn't change, I found teams that were working very well in an integrated system. Often, when you take it back to the shop floor, there were teams already doing it. And actually, I think, you know, uh, you sometimes have to get legislation to make the whole system change. But it does throw up quite a lot of governance issues, particularly from a professional accountability point of view. I had a significant debate with local authority that they couldn't dismiss a nurse or a midwife. As if the manager wasn't a nurse and a midwife. And now, I, I still held the ground in that because I was the accountable officer on the board around the nursing and midwifery, and I sat on the local authority board as well as sitting on the health board. And, but that took quite a lot of understanding around because the regulation makes it clear, like here, the regulation will make it clear that professional accountability is not 
And I, I mean, in, in Wales, it's, you know, Wales do quite a lot of learning from Scotland and some examples from New Zealand. The English system hadn't, as a matter of fact, the English system moved completely away from integration for probably a better integrated model to GP commissioning, and that's all in a bit of disarray at the moment. Um, some key policy barriers. I mean, I, I think the key one here, really, just to summarise, the key one here is how you get all of the regulators on board into an integrated system. So I, I think, you know, the regulations within the UK often can do a single assessment, you know, whether that was health inspector, whether else which come into a hospital ward and say, these five things are right, these five things are wrong. But they didn't look at the patient pathway from community within to the hospital system and back out. And actually, again, I'll go back to the bit of our evidence was 85% of the interactions That's where most of the inspections should happen. And it should be on a pathway basis, not a silo approach. And within the Welsh system, they had the social work inspectors, which had to then integrate into health inspector well. So it was just one approach to actually inspection. Um, and our regulator around the, the, the Nursing and Military Council, the NMC, they had to change some of their standards based upon where some of the experience was going to be obtained from students within training around obviously, you know, being in social care and getting that accredited from a learning perspective. Again, and they moved at a much slower pace. I thought we moved at a slower pace, but the regulators even moved at a much slower. Um, and I, I can very much recall, because one of the things within the Scottish system in particular, we had a lot of small community hospitals, and it, it was becoming very evident that, that wasn't all viable. Um, we had to engage with the public around um, actually different models of care. And even though they agreed with the model of care, didn't like the beds being shifted from the local hospital. Um, and, and again, I suspect it's a similar approach based upon my initial experience within the Irish system. You have to find a different ways, professionals and nurses and midwives, to have a different debate within community or within society like this. Just some examples of actually tools for professional integration. Um, and um, you know, I'm not going to list them out, but there's a huge amount of evidence now, particularly in relation to these tools. Of Joint care and joint care, and actually having the one assessment done, the one integrated assessment done within community that actually covers everything. And this is actually from the Nuxfield Trust, and the only thing I would probably change in that is integration care focus on people's needs rather than patients' needs. Because actually, this is a community, again, on the back, most of the interaction will happen within community settings, so therefore, I would be, I'm always inclined to call them patients. Patients and community doesn't feel right. It's often people in their own homes, and it's very, and that would, I, that would be the only thing I'd change. I was going to change it, and, but it's important. I, I don't plagiarise in the wrong way. Um, and I know Enda and others picked up on the importance of leadership at various different levels, and that is really, really important. And I think, you know, certainly my experience has been that nursing has played a very strong role in delivering integration services. Has actually led the way and, and, and has had the investment in order to do that as well. Get different roles, nurse consultant roles, advanced practitioner roles. And I suppose I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that everybody comes to work to do the right job and I'm solving the system that didn't help them do the right job. So it's really important we step into a quality improvement world rather than a performance world and actually I think data is great because it helps us as professionals have a debate on the information that's there but it's really important that we talk about quality improvement. I'm a firm believer every every registrant should do quality improvement training as well as leadership training. And actually you know they're probably two of the most important things in order to move and move forward on improving outcomes for and people whether that's within community or Again, there's some evidence to support that. So a couple of take-home messages. I mean, I'm not going to read those out because um, I'm conscious of time. And I think it's probably, this is drawn from my experience. You know, maybe you're tasked me to do this in two years' time, so this may look very different. Um, but as I say, I did test it out with some colleagues.
before I actually had to get into 